Thank you all for coming and welcome to the session, How to Have a Hit Factual Series. Um, hopefully in the next hour, we'll, rele uh, we'll reveal some of the elusive answers we've all been looking for about how to have a hit show. Uh, my name's Chris Majumda. I'm an independent producer. I run a production company uh, and we have an amazing panel here today. Uh, we have... On my left, Alison Kirkham, who's the acting controller of BBC Factual Commissioning. And Alison's hits include Backing Time for Dinner, Eat Well for Less, and Britain's Spending Secrets with Anne Robinson. And then we have Ralph Lee, who is the... <laughs> Sorry, it's <laughs> out of order. He's from, He's from oh Channel God, 4. So He's from Channel, Channel 4. 4. <laughs> this is going really well. He's the deputy creative officer, creative officer at Channel 4. And he and his team commission hits ranging from Goggle Bo Gogglebox to 24 Hours in a &E, Benefit Street and Guy Martin Speed. Uh, then we have Sue Murphy, who's the head of factual entertainment at ITV, where she's recently joined from Optimum. Her hits include Kevin MacLeod's Escape to the Wild, Employable Me for BBC Two, Mary Portis's Secret Shopper. Then we have Leanne Klein, who's the chief executive of Wall to Wall. She's behind hit returning factual formats like Long Lost Family, Back in Time for BBC Two, and long-running competition doc hybrid, Child Genius for Channel 4. And then we have Andy McKenzie, who is the Chief Creative Officer um, of the 2-4 Group. He's responsible for hits ranging from Educating Yorkshire to The Real Marigold Hotel and Channel 4 Entertainment Format, The Jump. Um, Amy Flanagan was going to be on the panel, and uh, Ralph has stepped in at the last minute, so thank you very much for him. So, with everyone from Vice to Netflix now commissioning their own factual shows, there's no sign of broadcasters' reliance on documentary to bring in the big audiences at a low cost coming to an end. Um, so, what's the answer? Is it the rig show? Is it cute animals? Hours to save your life? Super vets? Super nannies? Super scrimpers? Or maybe even mafia wives? They say no one knows the answers. There's no secret formula. But... You know, joining us here, we have some of the best people in the industry today. We have three broadcasters and two independent producers who hopefully will share some of the secrets about how to make a hit factual show. And of course, the commissioners are going to tell us what they're coming up. Uh, and we've also got the chance for you to answer, uh, ask questions. So please, can you get onto the festival app uh, and put some questions in? They're, they're not going to be any roving mics, so please use the app to ask some questions. So what constitutes a hit? What is a hit? I'm going to throw you all in the deep end and ask you uh, in one single sentence, is there um, a personal recipe for a hit factual series? Alison. Um, <clears throat> I used to, when I worked in current affairs at ITV, my editor used to say, um, everything has to be about money or medals. And, and by that, the money meant ratings and the medals meant reputational, award-winning. Um, and that's a shorthand, and I don't think it's wholly comprehensive, but I think it nods towards what I suspect a lot of us will say across the panel. There's no singular formula for here. It's all about, you know, when you commission a programme, certainly, um, and you're looking across the portfolio, you'll be commissioning things to do different jobs on different channels. And some things will be reputational, some things you'll commission with the hope that they will uh, bring in big audiences. Um, some things you commission knowing that they won't bring in big audiences, but they feel like really important particular things to do. So I don't think there's a single formula. That's a long sentence. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, Sorry. that's fine. No, no. You're already telling no. me up to be quiet. I'll be yeah. No, no. Uh, Ralph. Um, when Jay was talking about the kind of narrative of Channel 4 yesterday over the last five years, she was talking about a spine of returnable shows. And I think that word returnable has been really important sort of thing to apply to a lot of our factual. So there's a sort of sweet spot of factual uh, uh, on Channel 4, which includes Gogglebox and First Dates and The Island and Child Genius and Educating, One Born Every Minute, 24 Hours and any. And, and these shows haven't happened by accident. There's been a very kind of deliberate concerted effort put into developing, piloting, nurturing, and sort of carefully sort of bringing to air as many as possible shows that have kind of the possibility of impact over time and that can travel around the world. And in a way, trying to remind producers that our interests and theirs in trying to generate a brand and a show that can work, you know, use Channel 4 as a launch pad for a show that can work around the world and in other territories, it's a really good way of kind of aligning our 
common interests. And as a result of that, and there have been some misses along the way as well, but we've had a lot of shows that are now coming back for their, you know, in some respects, seven, eighth series, in others, the second and third series. We're about to launch Hunted again. We've got SAS, the Who Dares so Wins, to, coming back for a second series. So, so to kind of boil it down, to encapsulate it, just at the start, I mean, we'll go into yes. things in detail. Have you, have you, can you try and encapsulate it in a sentence or a few words? Yeah, I Returnable think is, is... Returnable important. is really important, but I think also these aren't subject-driven shows. They're often either based on a concept, a precinct, or a process. You know, Super Vet is a process show that's placed in yeah. a particular thing, and, and, and they're designed to have the potential for scale. Yeah. And so we've had to... And entertainment is tremendously important as well. Yeah. Let's not forget, you're, not, you're never going to get a show that can run over massive numbers of episodes and travel around the world, unless at the core of it it's got something very entertaining. So whether it's a narrative show like Educating or a process-driven show like SuperVet, trying to make, bring people in, take them for a ride, is really, really important. So. Uh, well, boil down, I guess, the two things, well, things that I think make a hit on ITV, but the two things I'm most looking for are simple, entertaining, returnable formats, properly presented by an exciting talent with a killer title, and or... Uh, noisy event one-offs, but would much prefer the former rather than the latter, so that we can bring them back and um, help our audience find those shows, but also, I guess, help indies have returning series, which is what everyone wants and everyone's happy. Leanne? Um, I am going to try and do this in one sentence, yeah. actually, if I can. But just to say that as a producer, obviously, it's a, my perspective is slightly yeah. different and a hit for an independent producer like us is a returning show. It can return in tens or threes, but it needs to have legs to go on and on and on. Because the first time you make any series, don't actually commercially, they're not really viable, so they have to run. Um, but I think the recipe for a hit show is it has to be a really broad idea, a clever take on a broad idea that will have broad appeal. It needs to be returnable. You need to make it execute it absolutely brilliantly otherwise it doesn't matter if it's a good idea it will not work and then you need a really supportive broadcaster otherwise it won't be a hit Andy she's just saying the words out of my mouth I think, <laughs> I think she's absolutely right I think there isn't a formula I've looked there definitely isn't one but by analysing the shows that have worked for us they have four things in common one they're an original idea uh, secondly they have a very collegiate relationship with the network that means you're skin tight with the commissioner, you're making it together and it's not advers adversarial in any way. Um, thirdly, you've got a brilliant production team. I've never had a hit that hasn't been made by a not been made by a brilliant production team. And there's, I don't think there is a hit in any reel that we will show that is a bad bit of telly. Um, and fourthly, uh, I know this is a, a trite thing to say, but friendly scheduling. I think you need friendly scheduling. You can have the best show in the world, but if it isn't scheduled in a friendly way, it can die in its arse. So, Alison, how do you define... I say they were all long sentences, I thought. I know, they were all... <laughs> Alison, how do you define a hit on the BBC? Well, you know, maybe it's more particular on the BBC because uh, there was a lot to talk about returnability and certainly that's one definition of yeah. a hit and it's fantastic when you commission things like well, Eat Well for Less or Back in Time or Marigold that's coming back um, and you know that they're going to provide um, stability in the schedule and, and you see the anticipation with something like Bake Off last night, you're, you're doing a job for the audience because they anticipate much love brands coming back. So that's fantastic. That's a hit in, on one level. But then you look at something like Exodus, which, you know, didn't get 15 million viewers, but um, is one of the things I'm most proud of when I look across the year last year and um, I think is one of the most important pieces of telly we've done for a while, and that's also a hit. So I do think uh, with our sort of public service remit, um, as I said, it can be money or medal. The big, returning, entertaining, familiar, broad, popular brands are hits for us. But equally, we will do we'll do one-offs. You know, on BBC yeah. Three, we do one-offs like Chasing Dad or Murder Games, and and they're important, noisy bits of television that are also public service reputational hits for us. Ralph, a, a high proportion of, of of your hits of Channel 4's factual hits over the last five years have been rig shows. So. SAS, Who Dares Wins, Educating Essex, 24 Hours and Any, First Dates. Are there any other shapes to hits on Channel 4? Yeah, I mean, they're not exclusively rig shows. Benefit Street wasn't a rig show. Mm. Uh, 999, What's Your Emergency, which has been a great, you know, returning 
uh, um, emergency service uh, documentary for us that's not shot on a rig. So the rig is really useful. What the rig, what the rig does is, is generate scale, you know, straight away. By putting 90 cameras into an A&E, mm. you get a program in 24 hours. You know, the traditional way of making a documentary is with one camera over a very long period of time. And we're making things in a completely different way. So the, the rig has been tremendously useful in terms of achieving scale for what were previously very traditional documentary precincts, but it's not the only way in. And, yeah. and what, what you've seen is an evolution of the rig from making quite purist documentaries like 24 Hours in A&E and 24 Hours in Custody to things that are much more constructed. You know, First Date is an entirely constructed show that uses a rig. SAS Who Dares Wins has taken actually not a particularly original idea and executed it using new technology and really good casting and brilliant production skills to make what feels like a very original show. The underlying concept isn't particularly new. Um, so the, the rig has been a, a, a transformative technology for us, but we're using it now in, I'd say, a really interesting diversity of different ways. Right now, we've got a, 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 a small 23-foot ship somewhere in the South Pacific with nine men on it shooting a, a kind of adventure reality doc hybrid called Mutiny, trying to recreate the journey of Captain Bly after the Mutiny on the Bounty. And that's got a rig on the boat. It's also got two embedded cameramen on the boat, which after the learning of making The Island and, and, and Hunted and other shows like that, alongside the rig, we're now using kind of immersive, kind of 24-7 immersed crews to allow us to get closer to experiences like that. So the rig's important, but it's by no means the, the only way that we've been able to achieve those, those kinds of scales. Also, people look at Gogglebox and they think it's a rig show. It's not. I mean, you know, it's, it's actually just sort of a couple of cameras on a tripod in people's houses. It's not, it's not a complex multi-camera shoot in the way that the other rigs are. And actually, once you've got a formula that works, you have to evolve it. Because unless you, you, you know, the sort of way that, that, that is most likely to end in failure is to take something that works and then endlessly replicate it. You've got to surprise the audience. So, you know, Channel 4 had the rig and they have evolved the way they use it. And that's the best formula for replicating success. But do you think things get, once you have a hit, things become derivative? You, you, you know, yeah. if there's something successful, you want to commission something else similar. Well, it, was, it was very interesting seeing the BBC One show reel yesterday in Charlotte's session because actually the ambulance show from Blast is uh, from Minnow, no, from Dragonfly, is basically 999 Watch Your Emergency from Blast. And the uh, uh, CCTV show from Blast is basically the, the last scene on CCTV. They just did a CCTV series for us. The look and feel of those shows is going to be very like the look and feel of Channel 4 documentaries in the last four or five years. So for me, I look at that and I think, well, we need to move faster. We need to evolve because that's what used to be, that kind of centre-cut interview cutting into action, which yeah. started with coppers on, on Channel 4, has now become the sort of standard way of making these kinds of documentaries. So we have to move on. We've got to, we've got to start getting filmmakers out there who want to shoot on different lenses and want to shoot on different technology and aren't just going to replicate those things that you see on TV every night of the because week. Audiences get tired, don't they? I think, they do. I, think, but I think we want to evolve, but also it's where the opportunity is for the independent producers because, of course, you get a hit. There's a million derivative shows. Uh, most of them don't work. But I think the person who comes up with, well, yeah, it might be a bit like that, but actually this is a new thing. This is how we're going to move it on. This is how we're going to give you something fresh for the audience. It's going to have, we're going to help you position it as something fresh for the audience. So I think that's where the opportunities are. You know, I think there's no shame in thinking, wow, that's an amazing show. It's really, really fa you know, fantastic. It's got universal appeal. It's got great ratings. What can we do that takes a little bit of that but moves it on and gets, gets a gets a big audience okay um i'm going to move on to we've got a lot to cover so let's talk about who makes the hit is it is it the independent producer is it the broadcaster is it a union between the two um you know success you know when there's a big hit everyone wants to be involved and when there's a failure no one wants to be associated it um so leanne is there generally enough support from commissioners and channels when you're trying to develop a hit? Well, the first thing to say is every single show we ever develop, we hope will be a hit. So there's yeah. no like, oh, that one's a hit and that one's not a hit. So every single show we ever think of and develop, we hope it will be a hit. Um, we, we work really closely with broadcasters from the get-go. I mean, we don't ever develop something without knowing what a broadcaster is wanting and you know we're strategic in what we develop we don't just sit there and pluck things out of the air having said that you know there's always a core at the idea that is original i think you just said it that the, the the derivative shows are a, a law of diminishing returns they're less, less likely to be a hit it's always the first one 
that will be the hit. And the shows that are a bit like them might be successful, but they won't be a hit in the same way. So it's better to come up with something original. That generally comes from a one small idea that you would take to a broadcaster, but then you have to get them involved. And then the development process is absolutely a team thing. It has to be. And how, uh, Andy, how's it, how's it worked for you in terms of, you were saying, you, everything you do, you work very closely, skin tight with a broadcaster. Yeah, it's essential. And uh, I know from being the other side of the fence as well, when I was a commissioner, all the, any success I had as a commissioner came working, feeling almost part of the production team. And that's how, whenever we work with any of these guys or their teams, that, that's how we do it. You know, they've got to go away from us, which is the horrible thing, being in a production company, and advocate it with their boss. And they've got to put their neck on the line for it. And so, you know, you want them to feel as committed to it as, as we are. You know, we all go into this in a collaborative way, thinking, as, as, as Leanne said, that it's the next big thing. You, you never, you always walk away from a green light thinking this is the next BAFTA, this is the next Emmy. You know, you, I, I always do with everything that we get. You know, sometimes something goes a bit wrong along the way, and it, and it doesn't. But you know, when you hit that sweet spot and you get the best production team, and everything else follows, and you keep that relationship tight, you know, it's. So it's can you have a hit? Can I say something? It's the such is, a long journey from the seed idea to landing something on a channel yeah. that get that gets an audience. You know, from kind of the first conversation on the first, you know two-line paragraph that pops into your inbox and you think there's something interesting there to kind of doing the development. Yeah, as Andy says, kind of, you know, getting it through the rungs in a kind of broadcast. You've got, to, you've got to then go and sell it to your boss and, you know, you've got to get everyone involved in it. You've got to get the marketing and the scheduling and the press and publicity, you know, and then even when you've got the show and you think, oh, this is a really good show, you then got to think about how do we position it and how do we, you know, get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of uh, marketing publicity and getting an audience to it. And I think someone said at one of the um, sessions yesterday to the Indies, go out and find yourself Soulmate, which I think is a very hard thing to do, but I think you know one of the greatest things. And I, like Andy, I've worked on both sides of the fence now, and I've worked across quite a few broadcasters. But I think when you can find the indie and the commissioner, and you know what, they might even be quite junior people, but they've got this thing going where they get it and they like the same thing. When it's not only you know you've got a chance of getting it through the system, but it's also it's like the sweetest spot because you know it's an honest, creative relationship. And I think you know that that's what we all want. And do you think bigger indies have? Uh, an advantage in development because they've got the resources and money and well, do and do broadcasters that, that, give that, enough I money think, for development now yeah there's a lot said at the moment particularly by a couple of networks about kind of working with bigger indies and i i, I take umbrage with that a little bit because being if you're big it means you're successful it means you're good at what you do and uh you know i don't want that to be a handicap um i want that to be a, a selling card yeah. um and you know the companies that Leanne and i uh, joined weren't the companies they are now. We've done it with great teams of people yeah. and, and making great programmes. And I, I think you should be rewarded and make more, be allowed to make more of them. Um, I think we took at 2.4, Mel and I took a decision to invest heavily in development. So we spend a massive overhead on a big development team because we want to have lots of ideas to talk about with them and then to bring to the broadcasters to discuss. And that's that brings with it a massive weight because I have to then find more work than probably the average production company to justify that overhead. But it's, a, it's something I'm willing to take on because it's the, I, I want to be dealing with lots of ideas and having lots of conversations. I think, you know, just being brutal about it, television success is sometimes a numbers game. You have to have a lot of conversations. Sometimes I take the same idea. I know this is an unsaid rule in the UK. The US is far more you can take an idea to lots of broadcasters. But I test ideas out on lots of different broadcasters because they're brilliant brains and I'm, I'm keen to know what they think, even if I know ultimately that they're probably not going to buy it. So we're talking about the development process, about taster tapes are really useful in kind of visualising a show. Alison, what do you look for um, in a great taster tape? Should we have a look at a clip that you've chosen? Is this Eat Well for Less? Yes. I, I think this is interesting because, um, I, for me at least, the worst kind of taster tape is the cell sizzle, which yeah. is just a sort of advert for... Um, a programme and doesn't really speak to what it's going to look like as an hour-long yeah. show. You know, I don't need a taster to sell something to me. I want to see proper actuality or talent as it might live and breathe in a longer programme. So um, I prefer taster tapes, which can be shot on an iPhone, frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, capture the bit of drama that you're hoping to replicate in the series? Or in this instance, it was just um, a bit of talent shot in a really authentic way, talking about what they knew. And I saw it. Uh, this is Eat Well for Less. Jim Allen brought it in. And... Um, and you just knew that he had something special. I mean, a lot of independent producers have, have told us that they feel the BBC is quite stingy with development money. Do you, do you, do you feel that? Um, we're financially responsible with licence fee personal money. No, look, in that instance, um, we, no, in that instance, we paid for a pilot. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, the thing that I sort of say to the team, uh, the way I think it's best to operate is put fewer ideas in development, yeah. they've got to be ideas you really believe in and then commit the funds. Rather than giving everyone 500, 1,000 pounds to go on a sort of wild goose chase that's unlikely to come to anything, yeah. I'd rather we put a bit more money behind fewer ideas that are more likely to, to come to fruition. And this is for any of the uh, broadcasters. <clears throat> Do you feel that we're talking about the relationship um, and you talked about soulmates, do you find yourself going on, going, you know, working with people you've worked with before? You think they've had a hit, or I'll go and see Nick and Max at the Garden, or because you know they're a reliable source. So it's not about the ideas as much as that they will deliver a hit for you. They know how to deliver a hit. Well, there's no doubt when you're looking for really upscale ideas that companies that have got a track record of delivering really upscale and difficult and ambitious and I mean, all these original ideas are almost impossible to execute. They're right on the edge of what's possible. The island is incredibly hard to make. 24 hours in A&E is sort of not really at, at the point of commissioning it a makeable show. So yeah. you, you, you have to trust the people that are making it. You've got to work really closely with them. And yeah, of course, if there are suppliers out there that have got a track record in making shows like that or, or delivering to that kind of ambition, you're naturally drawn towards them. I mean, any business would do that. That's completely normal. It doesn't mean that the ecology of the Indies doesn't constantly change. You know, there are Indies that are breaking into that group all the time. There are new emerging Indies that haven't made things that come in with ideas. Uh, one of my frustrations with smaller Indies is they come up with smaller ideas. And I keep saying to them, the only way that we can commission big things from you is if you start thinking bigger than the size of your company. So Andy's right. An upscale Indie has the advantage of generally thinking about more ideas and more upscale ideas. So naturally, if... For a broadcaster that wants fewer, bigger ideas that have more impact in the schedule, you're naturally drawn to those, to those kinds of indies. It, it, it brings to mind something that Alex once said to me, Alex Graham, where he, he, Alex said he thought that ideas were slightly overrated in our industry and that execution and that the producer's ability to make something excellent is actually underrated. And I think I slightly disagree with him about ideas being... Mm. I don't think you can ever uh, uh, underrate ideas and, and originality. But I agree with them about execution, because this isn't a wholly original show. You know, we all saw SAS, uh, and what was it called, SAS, How Tough Are You, or whatever, years ago. Are You Tough Enough? Um, uh, and we've made documentaries about the SAS. I think Channel 5 has got a documentary series on about the SAS at the moment. And uh, the BBC had a Freddie Flintoff thing about the SAS. So no one's going to sell this for its originality of concept, but the execution of the first series was extraordinary. And, you know, that was... That, that, that was it wasn't a convoluted or painful development process. There was no taster tape. You can't really do a taster tape for a constructed show like that. Um, what you can do for, for some things like... Uh, I agree with Alison about fewer, bigger developments are much more productive. I always sit down with my team and look back at last year's developments and go, why did we spend five grand here, three grand there, five grand there, two grand there? How many of those things converted into commissions? The things that convert into commissions are where we spend 80 grand or where we spend 20 grand or where we do a micropilot or where we do a kind of, you know, really upscale proof of concept. So a show like First Dates, we did a, you know, you can, you can test out a show like that. You can get a show for what it feels like. Gogglebox was the same. The job interview, which we recently tried out at nine o'clock, uh, the same. We were investing tens of thousands of pounds, not thousands of pounds, in trying out proofs of concept. And I think that's where development money is much, much more productive, not on the yeah. kind of scope out whether you can get a single documentary about X or Y. Sue, how are you um, looking to work with producers to get the kind of next big factual hit? Uh, well, I do, I do love a good sizzle. Uh, I do, I think they can be, you know, lots of different things. I do like something that does sell sometimes. I like to know what it is, why, why are we doing it? Why should I watch it? Uh, I think sometimes a sizzle can give you um, a tone and a feel for uh, the vision that the uh, producers have got for, for the, the programme they want to make. Um, I think uh, I, I, well, 
I love a good title, uh, and I'm a sucker for it. So, and do you know what? It can just be an email with a title. It can be an email with a title and two lines. Uh, and I think one of the one of the sort of challenges for us at ITV Factual, we're not primarily a factual channel, and I think kind of getting our voices heard, you know, in terms of making viewers come to it is really important. I think titles are really important for that. Um, I think that I think it's horses for courses in development. I mean, you know, I, I think that the proof of concept. Um, uh, sizzles are fantastic. Uh, I think sometimes we do, um, uh, you know, full pilots. Uh, I'm a bit nervous about those because sometimes you've then got to pull them out and actually it's like you can kill babies before they're born. Uh, but, but I think that, you know, sometimes just some, some sort of, you know, young or small indie comes in and they say, we've got this idea and they haven't got very much money to develop it. And sometimes I think it is worth saying, look, Okay, five or ten grand, I quite like it. Can you cast it? Go and do that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd kind of hate to say there's a kind of one size um, fits all. And do you feel ITV being a commercial channel and you, you have less room to fail in the, in the same way that Channel 4 first dates grew and, and was allowed to grow and become a hit, whereas on ITV, do you, do you have a bar and you have to get a certain number at a certain slot and go, otherwise it's not seen as a hit and they're not allowed to flourish and grow. Uh, yeah, well, I think to, to a large extent that's true. And I think we haven't really got, you know, we're not Channel 4, so we're not kind of out there innovation. And I think we haven't got very many nursery slopes. I think there are a couple of shows that have become staples of the schedule that start as little half hours and kind of in very early evening low funded slots and they've become shows that kind of you know sit in kind of you know in the eight o'clock slot and have worked uh, but i think it, it's pretty you know it, it's pretty um obvious that, that the bar's quite high at itv because we're a mass channel you know yeah. we want to try and get big numbers do i think factual can get big numbers on itv i do because otherwise i wouldn't I wouldn't be doing the job. I think we, you know, I think you can see factual getting big numbers on on lots of channels and sometimes on on ITV. And are there any magic numbers for certain slots that say nine pm? I know Leanne's nodding. There's, there's or lots. Eight, yeah. Yeah. There's lots of magic numbers. Yeah. So well, it would be really, really, really lovely if at nine o'clock a few mm. more shows hit the four million mark. Yeah. It doesn't mean if you don't get four million, you're dead because actually you might get I don't know. You might get three point six or seven, but we might. <laughs> Well, we can grow that into something. Yeah. If it comes like our big thing is we want returnable shows. We haven't got enough of them. So, you know, I think that um, I'm under no illusions if things get 0 0.9, they are dead. That's just the, the truth. But if things are on the margins, it's like, what could we do to give the second series a chance of kind of, you know, really pop in? And I think most first series aren't totally what you want the show to be, yeah. but you've just got think, is there something there? Is it that we like the talent? Is it, do you know what, if we really pack that full of content, we could scale that up. It, you know, th there's kind of lots of things that you can do, I think. Um, before we go on, please, if you've got any questions, do um, send them in on the app uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to them. Um, can I just make a point about development really quickly? Very just because there's yeah. so many supplies here. I wouldn't want everyone to come away from this thinking you need tape to sell a show. You know, like when, back, when Leanne came with Back in Time for Dinner or The Garden came with Anne Robinson's Spending Secrets, there are things that you can just see off paper and you know they're going to work. So it doesn't have to be a protracted, arduous process, though I'm sure sometimes it feels like that. And, and do you guys use data and research like Netflix, the way they came up with House of Cards is like, they looked at all the data and saw Kevin Spacey was big, um, David Fincher was big, this type of show did well, and they kind of created that show. Um, and before we go on and, uh, and you can answer that, um, our good friends at Eurodata have done some research for us, and um, we have uh, crunched some data... <laughs> Uh, and we've found out what the key ingredients are to some of the successes on your channels and algorithm, if you like, for success. Um, why don't we have a look at those? So for ITV, dogs. Yeah, dogs are good. Dogs work. Reunions. Plus Joanna Lumley. Yeah. Perfect. Equals Perfect. a hit. Perfect. So Joanna Lumley's Long Lost Labradors. <laughs> Title. So for the BBC, no, not snappy enough. <laughs> competitions, countryside, plus DIY equals a hit, and that would be the Great British DIY Watch Live. <laughs> and for Channel Four, we have kids, survival. I was going to say porn, but housing, 
and comes hit. And that would be the island of child architects. <laughs> Okay, that, that's from our good friends at Eurodata, so thank you for, for them. Um, would you, do you use data to kind of what, you know, what No, not, not, at the, not at the beginning of the process. We use it for lots of different things and research for different things. I mean, when, when you're judging ratings, it's quite useful to look behind the headline numbers. So when we did first dates first, and it was well below what we'd expect for the slot average, uh, uh, week by week, it was quite interesting to track the young share as a proportion of the overall share, yeah. which grew. So although the first series was kind of, you know, really well below our slot average, each week the young share and the proportion of young share grew. So things like that can give you an encouraging sign about, you know, over time you're winning over a particular audience. But in terms of concept testing, the only things we use kind of audience research for at that stage are sometimes we test titles, sometimes we kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, test concepts like that. But data doesn't inform you at the beginning of the process. Would you commission any of those shows? <laughs> any of those shows? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I've tried pitching it uh, several times, but she won't commission it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how important is talent in a hit? Front of camera talent. We talked about producers and the production team. I mean, can the wrong piece of talent kill an idea? You have an idea... Well, yeah, of course, yeah, of course it can. I, I, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, some ideas are talent-led, some aren't. We've got we work with great talent like Alex Polizzi, which is Channel 5's biggest program and works well on BBC as well. You know, and uh, you know, could you make the jump without Davina McCall? But you know, I, I don't want to overemphasize a point, but I agree with what Alex Graham said, what Ralph reminded. You know, the production talent is incredibly important in making a hit. You know, often. You know, with Education Yorkshire, I often think the editors, you know, unsung heroes, mm. uh, you know, a lot of the factual programmes that come from uh, Ralph's department, the editors are the stars. Um, production talent, for me, is, 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 is more important in giving it an, a chance when it launches. You know, we, our job is to create something brilliant. Can I make a point, Their job actually? is to find... Yeah, the, yeah the I think eyes. Andy's absolutely right. And I think it's interesting, because you talked about development money and whether the development's funded, but actually... A first series is development. When it, not, not for everything, but when it's a brand, you know, something like Long Lost Family, for example, which we knew if it worked would run and run, and indeed it has, and it's, we're going into series seven, I think, next year, um, or Child Genius, or any of those shows back in time, the first series is development, and it always takes longer. We work, I mean, we work hard on every series, but, you know, to get it right, it's harder because you're doing it for the first time. Yeah. So it takes longer to shoot, it takes longer to edit, it takes long, it, you know, and it costs more money. And <coughs> so, actually, the best way the broadcasters could help us to make the very, very best shows is actually to, to acknowledge that, I think. Because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. I think the first series of Long Lost Family took two years to make. I mean, the process in which the behind-the-scenes process of that show, as you can imagine, is mind-boggling. Does that mean returning difficult. series should come in a bit cheaper for us, Leanne? The, no, the, what the, it we means should, is we should pay we should more to, to begin with and yeah. then drop I mean, down. I mean, it's no, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's worth it's saying. Acknowledge for all of us that we put everything into... It's hard to make a first series of anything, and it is for you guys as well. So sometimes then it's really tough when we deliver it and then you suddenly look at it and it's going out against... You know, and that's... <laughs> We, any of us we've got a question. Great, perfect talent on Long Lost Family. Authentic, yeah. empathetic, really little right, bit of stardust. Yeah. We've got a question from the app for Leanne and Andy. Is the industry doing enough to ensure we have a rich vein of new development teams who will be responsible for devising the next big hits? Um, well, we, I mean, Andy's talked a bit about his development team and we, I think one day we should go for a drink and privately talk about how much we actually spend on development but I mean we you know development we put so much into development and our teams there are permanent people in the teams and then we churn the teams and it's a good place to bring in new people for short times uh, investing in development is the lifeblood of what we do we wouldn't still be here Waterfall's 30 next year I think but we've grown and changed massively in that time and we wouldn't be here if A, we didn't have all our returning series, but B, if we didn't spend a fortune developing new ones, that just is how it works, because it is a numbers game. But I think, you know, I think, yeah, we're always looking for fresh ideas, 
different sorts of people. We all need to have diversity in all our teams across the board, behind the scenes. But, you know, diversity, diversity in, in thinking of development is also one aspect of that. So, yeah, absolutely. It's hugely important. So what, what are you excited about that's coming up? Alison? Um, it's always such a difficult one, this, when you're sitting on the stage because you're thinking what's been announced and what hasn't been announced. Um, <laughs> In terms of talking about here, if we keep it to this, you know, it, it's fantastic to see um, the returners come back. Or, or, or by one ma yeah. um, metric, it, when, you, when you're bringing something back for a third, fourth, fifth series, you feel like you've done really well. And so, you know, to have Marigold coming back, Back in Time is coming back um, for its third series, and it's sitting in a really important season for us now. It's sitting in the history of Black Britain season, and so it, it sort of demonstrates how quite a popular factual here actually can graduate into becoming something that, that speaks to something really important on the channels. Why is Back in Time such a successful format? Um, for a, a couple of reasons. Um, I think it's about something serious, and, and for me, generally, hits have proper substance to them. They're, they're, they say something important. But I think this speaks to something that I always aspire to in TV. It's enjoyable to watch. Mm. It's pleasurable. You know, I, ju I just think we need to be cognizant of the fact that people come home from hard days at work, and they have lots of choices to make at 8 or 9 o'clock. And often they just want something pleasurable yeah. that will feel entertaining and warm and life-affirming, uh, but is not so slight that it doesn't sort of give them any added value. And I think this really brilliantly, tonally combines the both. There's proper content there, but it's, you know, people are laughing. It, 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 it makes you feel emotional. It connects people emotionally. Sue, what have you got coming up that you're excited about? And uh, a couple of things. So... Uh well, first, we've got a film going out on the 1st of September, which everyone in this room has to watch because it's just a, it's fantastic. It's made by a young director who's done the most brilliant job. Um, it's called The Murder of Sadie Harley. It's about a real-life murder um, that he's followed that's been in the papers. And uh, it's a 90-minute film, uh, and we've, um, it was part of a series, which we've plucked out of the series and made into a 90-minute film. And we've sort of cleared the schedule from 9 to 10.30 for it, and we've got behind it in terms of marketing. And I think it's just a, a one, it's a brilliant film, but I think it's also an example of how, do you know what, talent will out. It's a small company. He's a, very, he's a young director. I don't think he's done this sort of thing before. It's fantastic. I'm really, really excited about it. I love it to pieces. Um, I think we've got... Uh, well, we're developing a lot of crime uh, stuff, so I really want to get that <coughs> message out to everyone because we're going to go big on crime. It's something that really works for us. Um, we've commissioned a series in a, um, a sex transition clinic, which I'm very excited about. Uh, it's an idea that was brought to us as a one-off, and we've scaled it up, and we said, no, we want it as a series. Um, it's going to take probably you know, quite a long time to make, uh, but it's about that world. I know there have been other programmes on it, but it's about how... It's about the industry behind that world. Um, very excited about that. Uh, we've got Sugar Free Farm uh, coming back, and I'm excited on about that for two reasons. The first is, as I keep saying, we need those things that are going to return and we can make into brands. We're packing it full of much more content. Um, I don't commission with data because I'd have to kill myself, but I do love a good bit of audience research once it's gone out. And it was so fascinating for ITV. I think it was a surprise hit the first series. Yeah. ITV viewers are interested in, you know, can I turn my back on the overly processed modern food world? So it was really surprising. Um, and, uh, but the, the research uh, on it was interesting, which I think is, is something that we're going to apply across a lot of our shows. When people are pitching to us, they should think about this. Is, do you know what people said? They said, oh, yeah, we like the stuff. We love the farm, but we just want more content. Just give us more content. So that's coming back. And I think, again, with that for us, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, if we can bring that back and land it, that then becomes our nutrition health show, yeah. and then we can pack it full of content. And you've got a clip of... I have, yes. So my clip, so it's a sizzle that, so I haven't been at ITV very long, so it's one of the first things I've commissioned. Um, and it's a sizzle, which, what I think is a great title. Um, and uh, it's, not a, it's not a perfect sizzle, it's not a beautiful sizzle, and it doesn't give you the tone of anything, but I think that I just wanted to show it and then uh, tell people what were the things in that sizzle that made me leap and go to commission, because I think there's a few clues in there. So one of the things about Sugar Free Farm, I just want to say, because it's another thing that I really want people to think about 
for us is that whole world of reality plus purpose. So I think it landed at about the same time as Marigold, and I love Marigold, it's my favourite thing of the year. But that kind of thing where it's a reality show, but there's a very clear purpose as to why people are doing it. I think there's a lot more juice in that for us, because I think what it gives you is scale. And I think that with Sugar Free, I think when it landed, there was a, there was a really good BBC doc called The Truth About Sugar, which was a one-off doc. And I think, you know, sometimes we are pitched things like that. And what I want to say to people is, don't pitch me that, because I'm not going to commission it. But think about how you'd scale that up, put it into a reality setting. You know, could you make it into a big competition? Uh, but so, so, yeah, sorry, I'm rambling on. Quite succinctly, what, why are you excited by right. that show? I love the title. I love the fact it's access plus format. I love the fact that it's innovative access in that all, the entire murder squad are going to be wearing body cams. I think there has been body cams. I don't think the entire murder squad's worn body cams. Um, yeah. I love the fact that it's going to be presented by Trevor McDonald, which is something we worked with the, the production company to make. Um, and I think it's something that I would watch. And I love the pitch, which I think you don't get from the, uh, from the sizzle, but... Um, uh, the ambition of the show is to make it as if it's factual drama rather than another documentary. And I love those Northumbrian police officers. I think they just kind of get me there. Uh, but actually, although that was the pitch, we've scaled that up and we're going to be following various uh, homicide teams across Britain. And what time is that going out? It's Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Uh, Ralph, you've got a clip uh, of a, sh a, a show called Tavistock, but do you want to say something before? Yeah, I mean, a, uh, is there in a vein compliance? of what I've been talking about, yeah. what, what, a lot of the things that we've got coming up are those kind of big, scary, upscale, not in the stomach, not quite sure how we're going to deliver this, things like Mutiny that I mentioned, SAS is coming back for a second series, the makers of SAS are doing a similar thing for spy training and spy selection for MI5 and MI6, which I'm really excited about, we're on the brink of filming that, and we're also making a kind of innovative hybrid docs thing with Dragonfly, called The Jury, where we've effectively scripted and filmed a drama in which someone gets murdered, and then we've taken all the characters and we're using a kind of rig conceit to put those characters on trial, and the suspect then gets tried with a real jury. So it's a kind of... There have been attempts done before to use kind of members of the public to mock up a trial. I think this, is, this will be the most... And then at the end, you'll see the drama to see who actually did it. It's, it's the sort of most ambitious version of this that, that anyone's ever really attempted. So we've got a lot of new and returning big, upscale, factual shows. It, but it's obviously not all that we do. Uh, in the last few years, we've also done a lot of, lots of single documentaries, Cutting Edge is coming back this autumn, but also lots of these... Uh, every year we'd like to have two or three short-run documentary series like Bedlam, uh, Murder Detectives last year, uh, meet, uh, The Romanians are coming, all of which were three-parters. They've all won BAFTAs or RTS awards, or BAFTAs and RTS awards in most cases. We've got two coming up this autumn. One's called The Mosque, which is access to Birmingham Central Mosque, which is trying to, you know, three-part series looking at uh, a kind of broad spectrum of Muslim life in Britain, which is really good and, uh, and, and been made over a long period of time. And the, the, the last one, which I've got a short clip of, um, I mean, it's an odd clip to show in a way in a in a thing about how to have a factual hit. It's not how to have a factual hit. These, for us, are hits in the sense that they get between a million and two million, and they're challenging, provoking the audience, making they're them about pieces. things and They're reputational pieces. And as Alison said earlier, it's about money and... Uh, what was it? Money and medals. medals. This is tilted much more towards medals. I think it's really important that we're constantly making the audience feel uncomfortable, taking them into difficult places, taking them to places where there's real sort of complicated ethics going on, and this is a brilliant example of that. Before we show the clip, is there something you need to talk about, <laughs> a compliance issue? No, it's issue. just that at the, the beginning it says that, this is sort of one of those obvious TV things, that she says this is a secret, and clearly it's going to be on television. It's no longer a secret for those of you in the, uh, in the audience who are worried about whether or not we're revealing a secret. So success for that, for that film or show would be awards. Yeah, I mean, it's one way of measuring the impact. I think success really is, is, is it an outstanding, high-quality documentary? If it then goes on to win awards, that's great. I mean, I, I, when I watched that, I felt, you know, it's very much in the spirit of Channel 4 trying to take you to places that feel like they're dealing with some of the really tricky, ethically complicated issues of our time. That's access to the Tavistock Clinic, which deals with mental health issues across a broad spectrum for very young people. And transgender is something that's now become such a kind of uh, overt part of our culture, it's celebrated at the, Paralympi uh, the, uh, the recent Olympics, uh, and yet behind that, for the individuals involved, it's, it's really tricky and for, the, for the clinicians and for the you know, health workers involved and for a clinic like the Tavistock that's dealing with people of seven, eight years old and discussing with them whether they should have hormone treatment, kind of have irreversible physical changes done to their body. I think it's really important that we take 
viewers to places that deal with issues like that in their complexity. So that's the success for me. I mean, you know, we don't make it to win awards. Yeah. We make it because we think it's important to make and because we've been given privileged access to an institution that very, very rarely opens it do its doors. But our expectation is not that it gets four or five million viewers. Our yeah. expectation is that it's really good and it has something to say and you hope that that gets recognised. Andy, uh, your clip. Uh, our tilt at a hit factual series is a factual series set in a studio, which we're making for ITV. It's called This Time Next Year. Uh, it has Davina McCall in a studio uh, and two doors, one marked this time and one marked next year. And a series of people come out of the door marked this time and they tell a story to Davina about what they want to do in a year's time. It might be losing 10 stone in weight, it might be learning to walk, it might be finding a long lost love. They turn, they walk through that door, mark this time, and the very next second, they come out the door, mark next year, and it is next year. We've flipped a year in a second. So this was our attempt. This came through two bits of development that we found. Um, Mel walked in with one of those chat magazines she'd been reading on the paper, and it had somebody with those massive pair of jeans, and they'd lost 20 stone, and it was a before and after picture, and we thought that was really dramatic. And then somebody anecdotally in the development meeting said... Oh, yeah, I watch Grand Designs on uh, 4OD all the time, but I, but I don't watch it on 4OD. I record it because I just want to watch part one and I watch part four. I don't want to watch the bit in the middle. And I, I think that's what Long Lost Family does brilliantly as well. Adoption's a long, quite boring process. They condense it into a brilliant television narrative. And I think that's what we try to do with this time next year. I don't know whether that's going to work. We, who knows? I, I really hope it does. It, we sold it from one... It, the two unique things about it, we sold it in one meeting. Uh, you know, Helen Warner at ICV just bought it immediately. Uh, we didn't tell it to anybody else, which is quite unusual in the development process. And secondly, it's, it's been optioned in, you can't pilot it, it's been optioned in, and it's in production in 10 countries, it's been optioned by 30. It's, in many ways, it's already a hit for us and it's not been on the air. Um, so, my God, there's a lot of pressure on it for us as a production company for it to work. But in many ways, it's sort of, uh, it's, I hope I'm not giving away any secrets, I think it's our most profitable show and it's never been on air. That's interesting. That, that's really pertinent. Leanne, what's your clip? Oh, right. Well, my clip, actually, it was, an, it was quite difficult, this, because for a start, I always hate predicting what will be a hit. Yes. And actually, you never know. You can make four shows, one of them will be a hit, but you do not know which one. I firmly believe that. You make more brilliant, and you just don't know which one's going to land. And I was asked to give a clip at a point where we... Uh, actually wanted a I wanted a show back in time and then um, I was told that was old hat. So um, I'm looking at... Um, no one told me that. No, I know. <laughs> Funny. So I said, well, I'll show old back in time. And it's like, no, everyone's seen that. Show something new. So we've got four shows at the moment which are about to go out or will go out in the next six months, all of which I think have the potential to be hits in different ways. The clip I'm going to show is a BBC Two very, very big scale... Um, living history experiment. It's called the Victorian Slum. Um, and it actually started off as um, a sort of survival show but set in history. And obviously we do a lot of stuff set in history. Uh, but also actually we developed it and developed it with the BBC, with Tom MacDonald. Um, and it's become a much bigger story about poverty and the welfare state and actually it's the story of how the East End slums um, changed the way the world thought about poverty and created the welfare state and so it's got a big history story in it as well. It's not just actuality and reality so it's very rich, it's full of content, it's five hours of television. Uh, we're really proud of it, it's beautifully made. <coughs> And it's the sort of show that even if it doesn't rate brilliantly, I think reputationally it's so important and it's so great to be back to do those bold things. The clip I'm going to show, just for a bit of context, is actually from episode three. So there's basically 20 modern-day people who've gone to live in a slum that we've recreated in Stratford. Um, and a lot of them are descendants of slum dwellers themselves, so they're looking at their own ancestors' history. Uh, they've lived there for three weeks already, and it's really tough, and it's getting tougher. All that remains for me, uh, me to do is to thank Andy McKenzie, Leanne Klein, Sue Murphy, Ralph Lee, and Alison Kirkham, and our producers, Alistair Pegg, Hannah Wyatt, and Tony Dillamore. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>